So in this lab, we were looking at how can you make a voltage? One of the things you can do is you could rotate the magnet. When you rotate the magnet, this changes the magnetic flux periodically. Sometimes it, the flux is big, sometimes it's small, and since it's rotating, you kind of get this voltage and flux that change direction. It goes positive and negative and positive and negative. If you have a rotating magnet or a rotating coil, you can make a voltage that's what's called alternating. It's alternating because it switches from positive to negative and that shakes the electrons in place. When you talk about a hand crank generator, a wind turbine, an oil burner, a natural gas facility, all of those use rotation to make voltage that's both alternating and sustained. You can make it predictable so it goes the same rate the whole time. But from the lab, other things you could do to make a voltage, you could, oh, you could move the magnet closer. You could make the magnet stronger. You could bring the coil closer. So because motion is relative, either you can bring the magnet closer to the coil or the coil closer to the magnet, both work. You can put a larger portion of the coil in the field. That's actually gonna be the one we do the math for because that'll be one of the easier ones to use. When you put a larger portion of the coil in the field, imagine you're taking this coil and moving it to the right. So now it goes from having half a circle's worth of flux to a whole circle's worth of flux. That would make more flux and create a voltage because your flux increased. But same thing happens. If you can increase the magnetic flux and create a positive voltage, if you decrease the magnetic flux, you make a negative voltage which you can do by any of the opposite means. So bring the coil farther away, bring the magnet farther away, make the magnet weaker, pull the coil out of the field. So instead of the coil being half in, if I put the coil over here, now the flux has decreased and that creates a voltage too. All in all, there's lots of different ways to make voltage. And you can describe them using what's called Faraday's law. Luckily for Faraday's law, I do not anticipate you having to mathematically do this equation. <laughs> so can I get a yay? <laughs> okay, so what the law says is every time you have one coil, it gets a voltage when you change the flux. So if I have a hundred coils, then I get more voltage. Each acts like its own mini generator and collects more and more electricity. So I get voltage from each single coil. And if I can change the flux, ooh, 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 ooh. I'm gonna pause and we will go take our five minute break. You don't necessarily have to be able to mathematically solve everything, but you should be able to do proportions and know the relationships. This one, you only need to know the relationships. So what Faraday's law says is that in order to get a voltage, you take a bunch of coils, that's your N, and you change the flux in the coils. So the phi F minus phi I is that change in flux. If your flux doesn't change because you just like keep the object still, then you don't get a voltage because no kinetic energy in, no electricity out. And if you wanna make more voltage, well, you just do this whole motion in less time. So I like this relationship because it says all the same things, but it says them in a way that I don't have to memorize. I can read the equation and be like, oh, I could change the number of coils. I can make this go in less time. I can make the difference in flux larger. So let me show you an example of how you might use this. Um, and we'll use that to talk about what a generator actually does. Right? So if you had to use this equation, 
what I would take in this case is like, this is the example one we started with earlier. Take your area and your field to get your flux. Any one square loop would have a flux of 0 0.012 Weber's to start. But then as you rotate it, it rotates until the magnetic field goes to zero. So maybe this is something like the coil stays still, the magnet rotated, so now the field is not nearby anymore. That changes the flux. If the flux doesn't change, then you don't get a voltage. So in this case, the flux changes. I have 1,500 loops. So N being very large gets me a significant voltage here. Since I have 1,500 loops and each one of the little loops makes its own voltage, it adds up to a lot. In fact, this voltage is bigger than a household voltage. Your household circuit was at 120 volts. This is at 180. So this is a non-negligible amount of voltage. So while you're looking at it and you might be like, oh, when you use a little hand crank generator, that's not enough to power your house. Humans use this to power 96% of the electrical energy we use in the world. It is non-negligible. It is important. So when we make electricity, what we do is we need to change the flux. Right? If we can change the flux even by a little bit, you can get significant voltages by having lots of coils. That's why if you ever open up a hand crank generator or a little toy motor, if you ever open it up, you'll see hundreds of little coils all stacked on top of each other. So for conservation of energy, you and I are gonna assume that these are perfect systems. They're really not, <laughs> but we'll assume they are. We'll assume that all the kinetic energy turns into electrical energy. So you have kinetic energy, in this case, of the rising steam is the kinetic energy. That turns the generator, that turns the coil inside, making electricity in the light bulb. All sorts of power plants work this way. So steam powered power plants include your coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear works in that way as well. Uh-huh. Okay. We've got ones that burn wood. In other countries, they have generators that burn trash. Um, fun fact, sometimes people are like, oh, we could use that to solve our landfill problem. You actually don't want to do you actually don't wanna just burn straight up trash because um, that takes the carbon dioxide from the trash and moves it from being stored underground to being stored in the atmosphere. Um, normally, if you're in a, a trash burning power plant, they have lots and lots of safety and environmental aspects to worry about. So your energy diagram, always assume that you have conservation of energy and notice this is not potential electric energy. These electrons are literally moving. So this is not the potential, it's just straight electrical energy. All right, so last thing to close up then, what are you gonna have to do with this? Even though you don't have to use Faraday's law big equation, I'm gonna expect you to use the shortcut equation. This equation is a shortcut, but it has a little caveat to it. You can only use it one, or sorry, you can only use it two times. You can only use it if your coil is either entering the field or leaving the field. And let me show you why. If your coil enters the field, its flux goes from zero to some positive number your flux increases when you enter the field. If you are leaving the field, your flux goes from some positive number down to zero. So check that your problem has a coil that's either entering or exiting the field. If it's just moving along the center of the field, notice that the flux stays the same. So if I move it from this position to the right, the area stayed the same the field stayed the same. 
I actually can't use this equation. If you're just moving around on the inside of the field, all right, you don't get any change in flux, so you don't get any voltage in that situation. This one, I'm gonna expect you to do proportions. I'm gonna expect you to do calculations because this one's easier to use. You don't have to do multiple steps for it. So let's say you have a coil. You have a single coil, so that's n equals one. And it is traveling at eight meters per second to the right into a magnetic field. Let's calculate the voltage. So n equals one, just one coil. B, the magnetic field is five. Oh, but fun fact, check what L is. There's two lengths here. So how do you know which one to use? The length that you use has to be the one that's perpendicular to the velocity. In this case, the length that was larger is the one that's perpendicular to the velocity. So when you're choosing here, the 0.6 is the one that's perpendicular. So that's the one I would choose. And then we have our velocity of eight meters per second. All in all, this makes a voltage of about 24 volts, which is, you know, not insignificant, right? It's more than, more than two nine volt batteries put in series. So even though a regular generator that's mostly used for power is gonna work by rotation, we're gonna just do this as coils moving into and out of the field because it's mathematically easier to deal with. So we take that 24 volts, what can we do with it? Um, if we know the voltage, we could figure out, oh, we could figure out how the voltage changes over time. When the coil is outside the field, its voltage is zero. When it enters the field, this is a piecewise function. It jumps up to 24. When it's all enclosed inside the field though, the flux doesn't change. So it drops back down to zero as it travels through the center. As it exits, the voltage changes direction and becomes negative because now the flux is decreasing. So negative. And once it's all the way out, it goes back to zero again. So notice that this voltage is piecewise. The voltage changes over time. It's positive 24 volts when you're entering the field. It's negative 24 volts when the coil is exiting the field. And it's zero at all other times. So it's zero as you're going in between, as you're currently enclosed in field, there's no voltage because there's no change in flux. Enclosed in field gives zero voltage. Oh, last thing to be able to do with this ha, 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 is let's say, all right, we've got our 24 volts. Easy peasy. Could you figure out the current that goes through this coil? If you knew the voltage was 24, you could figure out the current. That's just Ohm's law. I did put Ohm's law equation on the back page of the homework in case you forgot it from last unit, but I would take my 24 volts divided by six ohms to get four amps of current. One thing to double check though, your coil actually has to be closed in order to make a current. If your coil has a hole or a gap, it actually won't work. So I've got this ring launcher. Where can we put you? Here. There we go. Flux goes from zero to big really quickly. Since the flux is changing, it's creating electricity, but it's creating electricity without having this electricity touch this circuit. Um, if you have an induction stovetop, that's how that works. You have a coil in your stovetop. Isn't that why like, they can... don't, don't they like not heat the air though? Yeah, they don't heat the air. They heat the pot itself. It creates a current in the pot itself, and that current has resistance, so mm. that turns the electricity to heat. Okay, so then, how about, what if we put a conductor in, but it's not 
hooking it up to something that will turn it into electricity. Right. In this case, it's going to turn it to kinetic energy. Huh. One more time. Copper is a really good conductor, but the trade-off is it's heavy. So. How did that not break the ring launch? I don't know. It's like what goes up must come down. Aluminum. It's lighter, but it's less of a good conductor. Oh, God. That's that one goes hard. up to about the ceiling of the room. Is there a silver one? There's not. No, nah, if you had a ooh, if you had a silver one, a silver one would be an even better conductor. But I think like copper, it's heavier. Yeah. So making projectiles, you want a trade off of low resistance but also light mass. All right, but the demo that I wanted you to see was what if it has a hole in it. If it has a cut in it and it can't make a complete circuit, so if we do this with a hole in it, it's kind of anticlimactic. It creates a voltage, but there's no closed path. It's kind of like having a battery on its own, right? It has a voltage, but it doesn't have a current because there's no closed path. So it doesn't get launched. In order to actually make it launch, you need that voltage to make a current. Mm. And that's our example for Faraday's law. Okay, you should be able to do homework 8.2 and a pretty solid amount of it. From block one, you should be able to do problems one through four. From block two, you should be able to do problems five six, seven, and eight. So I'll leave you to it. Best of luck.